Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Electric Underground podcast slash video cast. I'm very excited to have today's guest, Kayo or Kayo. I don't remember quite how you pronounce it. <laughs> Welcome to the show, my dude. Pleasure to be here. I'm Patrick Kiernan, better known as Kiyo Kusagani. That's right. See, I always struggle with these Japanese names because I have a tendency to really Americanize them, say like Ryu and Kayo, <laughs> Pokemon. Hey, even stuff. Capcom themselves didn't know how to pronounce Ryu's name. That's Call right. Him Call him a kangaroo as far as I can. <laughs> Does that mean that the guy from Ninja Gaiden, is he also Ryu or is he Ryu? Or Ryu. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> How do you pronounce these names? Anyway, today I'm very excited because not too long ago I did my video talking about the R-Type series. And now it's time to talk about the Gradius series, which I'm actually much more familiar with before I did R-Type. And I've played a lot of Gradius. And my dude has played a lot of Gradius as well. So it's be really cool to give our rundowns of the series and go through the games one by one. I... Gradius is one of those games that's more than just a game for me. I sincerely don't think that's what Konami was intending, but the <laughs> games push the emotions out of me, and I have quite the story to tell about them. <laughs> yeah, and I guess I should quickly introduce you for people who haven't seen you before, maybe or haven't heard from you before. I first came across you, I believe it was, uh, was it Kingdom Grand Prix that you did in Shmup Slam 3? Uh, Correct! And you did your commentary. I thought your commentary was absolutely hilarious and a huge surprise, and I was cracking up the entire time. So if you haven't seen that, people, go back and watch his commentary in Shmup Slam 3 of Kingdom Grand Prix, because that was a really good time. I also did a spotlight on Omega Fighter Special in Shmup Slam 4, yep. and... I intend to do a two-all the next one coming around, since I actually accomplished Mount Everest since then. What game are you going to do all? Omega Fighter Special. I okay. can actually pull it off now. Nice, nice. Yes, I remember last time. Well, awesome. So let's get started talking about our favorites in the Gradius series just to get going. And then from there, we'll start running through a very complicated series, to say the least. So right off the bat, what are your favorite Gradius games, if you were to rank them? Salamander 2, Japanese Life Force. Zezex, if that counts, and finally, Gradius 1. Yo, but the... honorable mention goes to Gaiden. Yes, uh, Gaiden is a sleeper pick. A lot of people really like Gaiden a lot. So my list, don't get too mad at me, Gradius fans, because it's a little funky, but I have just weird attachments to various Gradius games. So my favorite, favorite Gradius game is probably Gradius 2, for some reason. <laughs> I just I, good choice. Yes, I Gradius 2 is probably my favorite because it's that nice middle ground obviously between 2 and 3 or 1 and 3, but it's like more accessible than 3, but not um as sort of basic as 1 and I really love the sun and the graphics and I don't know. I just think it's a really overlooked sequel. So Gradius 2 is probably my favorite and it feels very Gradius, right? It it's not like some of the other ones where, you know, they have some variation. But after that, I'd probably go with Gradius 5. Don't hold it against me, but <laughs> uh, I love Gradius 5. Yes, the treasure. I'd only hold it against you if you pick Gradius 3. <laughs> no. <laughs> Gradius 3 is one of those shmups. It's interesting. We'll talk about them more in depth as we go. But Gradius 3, there is a player. I got to shout him out. Refkey who, I think it's Refkey. Oh crap, I hope it's Refkey. <laughs> who just- It is Refkey. Okay, good. That just plays Gradius 3 all the time and just plays it and plays it and plays it. So there must be something to that game for that You're thinking about him constantly. and GL3 Fleeco. Fleeco's awesome. Yeah, Fleeco as well, player. yeah. So Gradius 3 has some serious attention. There's some real dedicated players to it. So With I have- good reason. Yes. I'll elaborate that later. Yes. So my favorites are probably two, then five, then Gaiden after that. I do like Gaiden quite a bit. This is where it starts to get a little tough for me because they all start to blend together in my head as far as how I feel about them. But I, I'll go with Salamander 2 as well. I like the Salamander games a lot. So Salamander 2. Um, and, then to end, and then to end it, I'm going to go with 3. Even though 3 is insane, I'll end my list with 3. <laughs> you can 
actually go well down the rabbit hole beyond the number Gradius games with its spin-offs that were featured in Otomedius, Parodius, yes. which are part of the series. Yes. Yeah, and we'll talk about those at, at the end. And there's also like Gradius inspired games as well, like Super Hydora and all sorts of shmups that were very heavily inspired by Gradius as well. Yo, I'm going to give an instant shout out to Garudius95 on <laughs> PC98, Japanese yeah. Dojin game. Gave me the feeling of playing Gradius for the first time all over again. Truly outstanding game. I've heard a lot of good things about it. I've never played it, but I have heard a lot of good things about it. You said it was a Dojin release on the PC Engine? PC98, not oh, PC98. PC okay, yeah, PC98. So that's like the Toho machine. Okay. That's now what a lot of people like to think of as that, but it's way more than just a Toho machine. There were a lot of incredible games on it, and even the unseen world of Shabup Creator or Dezemon games. Yeah, and I think uh, Jamers, I'll throw it on the screen here, had one of those on his channel recently that looked absolutely insane. Yeah, there was a Dezemon game where it took place in the Vietnam War and the first stage was target practice until you got dumped into the real thing. It was honestly <laughs> insane. All right, then you got to take out the Viet Cong. Yep, then you get dumped into the real war zone and it gets much more brutal. <laughs> nice. Okay, so we have laid down our list of our favorite Gradius games. Now let's get started. Do you have a little bit of a background on Gradius, a little bit of history? Because I know you're really... Uh, familiar with a lot of games histories. Oh, hell yes. I, I am en <laughs> endured to this series. Yes. So, mind if I take it from the top? Absolutely. When you're part of a modest family household without the budget for the latest Nintendo Lunch Cube, whatchamacallit, <laughs> you had your dad's selection of NES games. I had my Mario's, I had my Duck Hunts, but one of the games was Gradius. It was one of those games that started off erupting literally and the only way you were ever going to see more was to jam your thumb into that controller to push always onwards <laughs> never relenting it was a heck of a challenge for six to seven year old me but i was mesmerized by it it was my first exposure to a major sci-fi series and i was always wondering about what was going to happen next in that game all the stages being fantastic contributed to that of course and thus it was the first shmup I ever cleared, and it set the groundwork for my future in the genre, so to speak. So looking back now, how do you feel about the Gradius 1 port on the NES compared to the arcade version? Considering the technological limitations at the time, and the fact that not many developers knew how to optimize very well for the console, it was a darn solid effort. Yeah, I always thought and that as well. I, I thought it was pretty solid port. Plus. They also added in new secretive elements to make the game easier than its arcade counterpart. Likely I was able to clear that when I was young, but not the arcade version. Does the NES version have built-in auto-fire, or do you have to sit there and hammer that, that B button? <laughs> there is auto-fire, but nice. you need to get a secret in order to activate it. Oh, okay, nice. Like a Konami code type thing? No, the Konami code gives you all power-ups back and helps you recover for debug purposes. But no! If you actually destroy our enemies in a specific order in Stage 2, you get auto-fire. <laughs> and likewise, if you destroyed 10 Moai statues or more in Stage 3, you warped to Stage 5 instead of going through Stage 4, for instance. That's fun. Is that exclusive to the NES version? Like, the no, warp? No! Is the warp They exclusive? actually added that to the PC Engine port. How about the arcade version? Is that warp in the arcade version? No, the arcade version was the original and didn't warp at all. Oh, <laughs> I wonder if they're sitting there and they saw like Super Mario Bros with the warp pipes and they're like, that's a good idea. Let's add some warping to Gradius. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. Also, Tower of Jiraga was an influence too. So I have some thoughts on Gradius 1 as uh, the very first game in the series where like our type, I always thought R-Type was really impressive first game because it's sort of the series as we know it, almost completely intact right from the beginning. Gradius is like that as well. It comes in, you have the Vic Viper, which is my favorite old cool, old school sh uh, ship. Not only because it looks cool, but because it has that thinner hitbox than most ships of its time. You know, it's kind of like the very first bullet hell ship almost because 
It's like I should also interject that the NES version's force field uh, actually protected the entire ship and not just the front of it. Oh, is that not in the arcade version? In the arcade version, you would still get killed if you got shot from any angle that wasn't dead front. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, it, it's interesting the balance patches they add in, or whatever you call it, the balancing they add into the NES version. So I like the, the Vic Viper a lot for that reason of it being sort of a slim profile. Then, of course, you've got the power-up system, which is very classic of Gradius. And then on top of that, you've got the options. I don't know if there were shmups before Gradius that had options of that type, but I, I always associate those sort of following style options with the Gradius series. Do you know if there, there was, was anything beforehand with those types of options in it? There was Sega's Tax Scan game where you always had three ships following you and Starjacker. But Konami, we find it to be far more strategic. Yeah, especially when you get the lasers and you can like stack the lasers and like speed kill bosses with them. Or if you're in sort of an open area, you can uh, line them very uh, vertically so you can cover a lot of space with them. And then you have this very interesting level design with the Gradius games all throughout where you've always got something on the top of the screen and then something on the bottom of the screen sort of like crawling around and shooting up at you in, on top of the stuff coming directly towards you. So it at times, especially when you get further and further into the game, it's starting, it's not there, but it's like starting to hint at a bullet hell. It's like, there's a lot of shit on screen right now uh, compared to a lot of other old school shmups. I, I always felt like Gradius is sort of um, the prototype almost of what you'll see in bullet hell games later on. Interesting theory on that, because I always considered the prototype of Bullet Hell to be Top Plan and Tatsujin 2, or Tatsujin O. Yeah, but I, isn't Gradius quite a bit older than Tatsujin? It is, and I yeah. think the higher bullet count was to encourage you to use Force Field properly, for <laughs> instance. Yeah, I mean, of the old school shmups, you know, like the Darius and the... There actually R is types. one game that's more extreme than Gradius. It had quite an intense bullet count, but... It actually was beaten by Argus and NMK games back then. What game is that? Argus was the NMK game where your weapon changed every single level and your your ship was incredibly tiny. I think that was 1985 when that came Oh, out, wow. The same year. Yeah. NMK are a really cool dev that often get sort of overlooked. But for Konami's game, for the purposes of Gradius, it's to encourage you to use your force field properly and call it out when you are in a very tight area, for instance. Yeah, and also because of the bomb system, where you have those little bombs that drop down. And so sort of to give them a, a purpose, there's always something sort of crawling around underneath you. So I don't, I don't know. It'd be interesting to see what people think. But when you watch like higher rank, you know, further on Gradius runs, even in the early games, I'm like, this is getting near bullet hell territory at times with how much crap's going on. And of course, the Vic Viper, like I said, being a bit lower profile of a hitbox than a lot of other old school shmups. You interjected about our type, by the way. You uh, have the same opinion on Gradius 1 as that. You think that other games in the series are better despite introducing the basics, right? I would say I did this in my greatest shmups of all time list. I don't know where, I don't think I put Gradius 5 in that. But like with R Type, I would I was arguing that historically R Type One is clearly the most important in the series, just because it brings almost the entire series to the table the very first game, which is super impressive, and of course just the influence of that game. And I would say the same of Gradius. Yeah, like it just brings everything to the table. Here it is. But as far as like the boss fights and some of the level design, I do like uh, other games in the series later on, or even Gradius 2 more. But the first is still really impressive. Ah, I'd like to share my perspective on that. Because I feel as though Gradius 1 is actually better than quite a few other games in the series. Well, go ahead. What, what, what makes it stand out? What makes it stand out to me personally is how tight the design of these levels are compared to later games in the series. One of the most infamous hallmarks of this series are the checkpoints and the checkpoint recovery systems, mm -hmm. which causes some people to detest these games when they first pick them up. But- Gradius syndrome. Yeah, there's a term for that. <laughs> but in Gradius 1 specifically, 
every single checkpoint, even the last stage, was thoroughly tested to ensure that you would be able to get through them with just your pea shooter because each checkpoint is handcrafted to give you exactly the amount of power-ups you need to get through it. There's always mercy power-ups on every single checkpoint that's not the first stage. So on stage two, for instance, you're given three power-ups so you can get a speed up and a missile, for instance. And that, in my honest opinion, makes it considerably fairer than some of the checkpoints put later on in the series. Absolutely. I definitely can't say the same for Gradius 3, and <laughs> that helps it stick out. Just because of how well polished it is, that makes it a top-notch game in the series. Easily an A tier if I had to put it on that sort of list. Oh, we should do that. Yeah, that's a great idea. I would also put it on A tier. Here is an interesting thought on that point, though, because I do agree absolutely that the checkpoints in Greatest One are much fairer than the later games. But I kind of wonder what happened with the later Greatest games, especially three, is um, Konami ran into a bit of a problem with the checkpoint mm. systems. And this is why I kind of argue that you've got to be really careful with checkpoint systems, because if you balance them... If you balance them around having to recover all the time from no power up to whatever you need, the pea shooter to get through the section, then you always need to sort of curtail the level design at least a little bit. You need to depower it a little bit in order to get those checkpoints to work from a fresh death. But I'm wondering if what happened with Konami is they wanted to push the intensity of the levels and then they realized, well, if we do this, it makes it harder to recover, but then they're like, eh, we take your money anyway, who gives a shit? So I, I, <laughs> that I was kind Konami's of, attitude. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, so I, that's Konami for you. Yeah. So I kind of wonder if, in a weird way, the later Gradius games are almost built around the idea of Gradius Syndrome, where they're built around the idea like, okay, we know that we're just going to beat you down and take your money if you try to recover. So if you die. And then they got called out for it in Gradius 3, so they fixed it in Parodius and Zesex. Yeah. So I, I kind of wonder, I think that's why, that's, this is my my guess as to why Gradius 3 appeals to these certain super dedicated players like uh, Fleeko or uh, Refki is because it has really intense level design that is absolutely brutal that attracts that sort of player. But like your average, your average player gets into these checkpoints and it's absolute hell. So maybe there's a bit of a trade off there depending on what you value. And that settles my placement for Gradius 1. Gradius 1 is always one of those games that I can pop in and play for half an hour or however long I last and have a good time with it every time I do so. Invoking all those memories and those feelings of triumph that I got when I played it as a kid. And would you say its strongest point is its balance on the checkpoints? Yep, that and the design itself. The classic Gradius design, its simplicity is also a selling point for people too. That's true, yeah, absolutely. Very I've actually true. talked to people that say they like Gradius 1 more than the later games because they aren't overwhelmed with options. <laughs> yeah. Especially not not start... those kind of options though. <laughs> I know what you mean, like when you start getting into the later, like Gradius 5 and everything, you need to like break out an instruction manual to figure out how to play the game. Uh, it's and much that more is the second greatest point for Gradius 1. There's my two greatest points for it. I would say, I agree with those, I would agree there. And I would say its biggest weakness, because we should do the biggest weakness of each game, is... Copied level design, easily. Stage 4 is the biggest weakness of it. Yeah, yes, I was going to say that. Like, it, it, the levels sort of blend together sometimes, where you're like, uh... <laughs> yeah, I've, and that might be straight up just memory limitation. I, I don't know the hardware that well, but it might be that- It ran on bubble memory, and that needed to be heated to the right temperature before it even worked. Even then, with it being able to store a lot, it was still prone to failure very constantly back then. Oh shit, I've never even heard of this. So what's bubble memory? Bubble memory is the piece of hardware that Konami used for Gradius 1, and they figured that it would be a way to deter piracy from the game and, you know, reduce operating costs. But it needed to heat itself up in order to actually read the memory correctly. <laughs> the temperature was very cool and thus, due to it overheating itself, it failed a lot. <laughs> Holy smoke. So if you're like, let's say you live in a hot, arid desert or something and you have your Gradius PCB out, out, uh, you know, in a non air conditioned room, would that thing just cook in there? What would happen? 
It very likely would. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so you gotta like put your Gradius, uh, you have to keep your Gradius PCB uh, in air conditioning. Yeah, not too many of those boards survived because of all the operator complaints and the failure rate, they just converted it to a standard ROM afterwards. And that's the most common version of it. Wow, that that's crazy. I didn't know that. Alrighty, yeah. so up next, I'm really interested to so, hear your thoughts on Gradius 2 because this one I really like a lot, but it's hard for uh, me to pin down fully why, you know? Ah, uh, so you're skipping over Salamander going great to two, huh? Yeah, I thought we'd do the Salamander. Do you want to do Salamander later, or should we do them in release your order? Your show, your rules, man. Okay, I'm let's do let's do Salamander then. We'll do it in release order then. So let's do Salamander next. So Salamander basically took the most interesting levels from the original game, the biological nightmare fuel, and decided to expand that into its own game. It took one of the best aspects, or the most imaginative aspects of the original, and expanded upon it tenfold to establish more of the series' identity as we know it today, where you go to all sorts of crazy planets. It really is an interstellar voyage that's more interesting to look at than Gradius 1 was. It's oh, already yeah, got a lot of people's absolutely. attention. Absolutely. Big, big jump in the graphical design, for sure. But the other, the other uh, very interesting point about it is its accessibility. They did away with the power-up bar in order to make the power-ups instantaneous instead. Yes. While retaining everything great about the original Gradius. So what do you think about that? Of the two systems, do you like the power-up system or do you like the item power-up drop system of Salamander? The item bar, the iconic item bar, it gives the game way more strategic value. But this was only the second game in the series. So Konami was still experimenting and finding out what worked and what didn't. I'd call it early installment weirdness. <laughs> yeah. Also, isn't Salamander, correct me here, doesn't it switch uh, orientation between levels where it goes from yes, horizontal to vertical? Yes, and that was always very, that was always a very cool effect. Yes. So did you like the vertical levels or the horizontal levels better? I, I like both of them exactly equally because they were designed equally. Yeah, I've always felt I've always felt the same way too because in some games like Axelay, the horizontal levels are just way better than the vertical levels. So I think uh, Konami did a great job, and Konami made Axelay, but uh, I think they did a great job here at sort of balancing it between the two, where they both feel really fun to play. However, this is where the series found most of its identity, like I established earlier, and the set pieces were far more interesting, especially when you had to go between two suns with both of them erupting flame walls mm -hmm. of death. Yes. That was incredible and exhilarating. I love the suns. Yeah, that's one reason why I like Greatest 2, is the sun level. However, my biggest gripe with Salamander is it was pushed out very quickly as a sequel to the original Gradius. It is a very buggy game, and it shows, with the power-ups eating your shields, for instance, and counting as projectiles. Oh, shit, I didn't know that. <laughs> Good to know. That's where, Good to know. That's where, and that's where Japanese Life Force steps in. Yes. Can you can you explain? So Salamander and Life Force are the same game, but different regions, or are there patches in between the two of them? It's a drastic update that was sold to tied operators and players over until Gradius Two is ready. Okay, so we got Gradius One, then we got Salamander, and then Life, and Life Force, Force, and then Life Force is the patched version of Salamander. Correct. Okay. It was originally released as a reskin for North America, but then they decided to sell it in Japan, do the graphical overhaul even further, and fix the bugs and glitches that were present in Salamander, bringing the classic Gradius power-up bar back too. Oh, okay. So yeah, because I felt like th that was always confused as to what the hell was going on with Life Force when I was playing through the Gradius series. I'm like, what? Is this and a that separate is series? My sec is and this? that is my second favorite game in the series. By fixing the bugs and the really janky elements of Salamander, we ended up with a game that had the strong aspects of Gradius wrapped in with the better level design and set piecing of Salamander. Yeah, and I know Life Force is crazy loved. Like people, you know, I've heard a lot of people say Life Force is among their favorites. I've always, yeah, I've always kind of wondered, so it's good to get this clarification. 
it's not a separate series necessarily. It's sort of like an in-between of Gradius and Salamander. It sure is. And it's very confusing to a lot of people that are just starting to follow the series. But I'm glad <laughs> to clear that up. If, you know, play Life Force Japan, I would pass on Salamander. Play the version of it that doesn't eat your power up, doesn't eat your shield with power ups. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and the other major thing that was introduced there is the difference between ships. That's the first time they distinguished Player 1 from Player 2. Road British, or Road British in later translations. So what does Player 2 do that's differently? They rearrange the order of the power-up bar completely differently on Player 2. If you're playing Lloyd British, you get Missile first, Option third, and Speed Up last. It's a power-focused ship instead of a speed-focused ship. That seems like a improvement, right? Because you... And that set the foundation for the selectable power-up bar. It was prototype Gradius 2. Yeah, because... Well, it, de it depends, right? It has like trade-offs because on recovery, I could see not having the speed up, having the speed up so far away on recovery could be a nightmare. But like yeah. kind of early-ish on. Uh, on loop one, Lord, Lord British is definitely easier, I feel. But yes, yeah. my biggest score, my 1 million, 1.5 million run was done using Vic Viper and using speed to recover. Oh uh, yes, that because yeah, because on recovery, you want speed right up front so you can move. Especially for stage five. <laughs> All right, so what do you think is the strongest part of Life Force? Easily, it's stages. This is when the series really went over the top with its stage design, and every single stage in this game was memorable. I couldn't get enough of it, and it felt like a roller coaster ride that was top notch in every way imaginable. That is my idea of what good shmup stage design looks like. Yeah, and I'm going to make my strong point of Life Force the balancing between the vertical and horizontal stages. I wish more shmups would, would do this, even today. Like, why can't we have, you know, like Zero Ranger kind of did that a little bit where some of the stages would like change scrolls a bit. But I kind of think that's still an option people could explore more of having a game that swaps between horizontal and vertical and sort of tests you on both fronts. So I, that's my favorite part of Life Force. Yeah, it continues to stand out from other modern shmups even to this day. Yeah, and I think it did a better job than something like Axley where you play, I love that game, but when you play the, hor uh, the vertical stages, you're like, all right, <laughs> these are kind of jank compared to the much better horizontal stages. And then obviously, like I said, Life Force barely has any weak points whatsoever. But Salamander had its bugginess, which was corrected in the update. It was a very popular game in Japan, so the demand for it was real. Yeah, I would say, um, I'm trying to, th the only thing I can think of, and this might be a little bit of an unfair criticism, but I don't really like the idea of having the separate sides of the ships be super different from one another like that. I think like a little bit of a difference between the ship sides is fine, but having like such a drastically different ship on player two, like if you walk up in the arcade and you just throw the quarter in and you have no idea the difference between the ship, I think it's a little unelegant in my opinion. Yeah, you can see it in the attract mode. I'm going to cut the game from 1987 a little slack, like I do for most early games. Well, didn't they, uh, and you said in Gradius 2, that's where they're like, you know, they kind of took that idea and they sort of expanded on it in Gradius 2, which brings that's us. That's exactly it. And that's a good segue to Gradius, Gradius 2. 2. Yes. So what are your th overall thoughts on Gradius 2? Gradius 2 is basically what would happen if you combined the tighter, stricter mentality of Gradius 1 with, and, its, and the length of it with the superior set design of Salamander. We're back to using power-ups as strategically as possible, but now the level design has improved tenfold. Yes, I agree 100%. And I remember Gradius 2, that opening stage with the suns and the, the, the things on fire and everything. I was like, yeah, it was so notable. we are Burning cooking. <laughs> Burning Heat got used in Dance Dance Revolution. The song was that well beloved. <laughs> yes. I, I really liked Gradius 2 a lot. I thought it was a very strong improvement over the first, uh, for my, in my opinion. Every single level is unique in Gradius 2. You go to Xenomorph World, you go to an ice planet, you revisit the volcano section from Gradius 1, 
only more ferocious than before. And I, the list goes on and on. Yeah, and, and all of them are mostly super memorable. Yeah, and didn't it feel, at least to me, it felt like pretty polished as well. I didn't, like like we're saying earlier, we'll get to Greatest 3 in a bit, but felt still pretty fairly balanced. It didn't feel too out of control as far as Yeah, the balancing and that issues sort of are stuff. actually in your favor as opposed to out of your favor. <laughs> right. Yeah, so um, I'm trying to think, what do you think is the strongest aspect of Greatest 2? I'm going to go with something a little bit different, which is the graphical update from 1 to 2, I think, is really impressive. So I'm going to put that as my strong point for Gradius 2. My strong point for Gradius 2 is the selectable power meter. Because that, you know, aside from edit mode in Gradius 3, was the logical expansion to the power-up bar. And all four power-up types are relatively well balanced. There's somewhere, you know, it's a little bit more useful than others, but all four types can clear the game elegantly. And that was insanely rare to see back then. You <laughs> yeah. get to customize the game to your liking and pick the weapons you feel are most fun. I personally like Type D with the dual with the dual missiles and the ripple laser. Oh yeah, ripple laser is awesome. <laughs> Whenever I get the chance, I go ripple every time. It has more range, and if you're capable of mashing the button fast in exchange for not having auto fire, then it has a wider range and also fires faster than your standard shot. It's still an upgrade even if you can't mash very fast. I didn't the extra know that. bullet on the screen makes a big difference. Wow, I didn't know you could mash it faster than auto fire. Yeah, you get three bullets instead of two at a time. That makes a huge difference. That's cr <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, so anything come to mind as the biggest flaw of Gradius 2? Because you didn't put it as your number one. The biggest flaw of Gradius 2 by far is that Konami was starting to catch on that the balancing was starting to get a bit sloppier at this point, especially when you reach the last stage. Oh, yeah. At this point, you know, there's, there's, there's no more mercy power-ups on certain checkpoints. You get, like, squad all in the later stages. Because Konami was, you know, thinking that the average Gradius player was quite good at the game by this point, so they're jacking the difficulty up at this point. Like, dying at the entrance of the enemy base is pretty much a death sentence for most players. Yep, that's that was going to be my point, too, is this is where you start to really encounter Gradius Syndrome. <laughs> Gradius Syndrome, uh, like, at, yeah, that's exactly my experience playing Gradius, too. You're, you're flying through, you're playing through the, you know, first early stages of the game, and you're just like, this is, this is great. I'm having a great time. Everything's going well. Then you die in the later stage, and you are in for a rough rough uh, recovery. Yeah, most of the checkpoints in Gradius 2 are good, but some of them are really pushing it, like I said in my own review of the game. Yeah, so you start to you start to see that issue begin to arise in Gradius 2, but it isn't full force, which is Yeah, all the see. checkpoints are still recoverable, even on the second loop, but even so, <laughs> some of them are still really stupid and lopsided. Yeah, and I, I do wish that uh, Gradius they, I wish in these early games that they did do a little bit more with, like, on respawn, maybe just giving you some power-ups, like, built in. Like Gradius respawn. 1 did, because Gradius 1 gave you those mercy power-ups every time. Right, and I, I think they could have even integrated it into the respawn. You know, like, you actually just respawn and bam, you have speed, you have maybe a, an option or something, you know. A little, a little more than being, like, a turtle stuck in a in a beach full of vultures trying to eat you. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, Gradius 2 is an epic game. The jump to brand new hardware did wonders for it, and that would continue to define the series for a very long time while their ideas were still fresh. So, we talked, you mentioned Gradius 1, how it had all those bubble memory issues. Gradius 2, are there any sort of hardware issues on this people need to be aware of? Nope! It uses a standard twin 16 board, two 16-bit processors, and it's standard arcade hardware all across the board. Okay, cool. So if you you if you buy it, like if you buy the PCB, you're not gonna uh, be yeah, buying it. Yeah, it's a, a standard PCB. You just yes. treat it like a normal PCB. <laughs> treat it right, and it'll treat you right. You know, I, now that we're talking about it, I'm curious. How do you know much about the PC market for the greatest games as far as pricing? Because 
I would assume that they can't be that expensive, right? C comparatively to other By arcade PCB price standards. Yes, yes, Nemesis and Gradius is a very common board, so it's fairly easy to get a hold of one of those. But you're still going to be paying jacked up prices for it at the moment since the demand is there. Yeah. So what are you looking at? Do you think... Well, we can research this later if not, but do and you know on the top you of your head... On Gradius yeah, 2? off the top of my head, for Gradius 1 or Gradius 2, you'd be in the $120 range or something like that. Oh, that's that's pretty damn good. That's pretty yeah, good. And that's for Gradius 1, since I know the prices for that. They're <laughs> very darn common due to the popularity. Yeah. Gradius 2 might be slightly more expensive, but I know Gradius 1's pretty easy to get a hold of. Yeah, because they're every... You're, yeah, I think I even remember seeing Gradius cabs growing up, and that... I didn't see a lot of shmup cabs growing up, so that's pretty pretty impressive. I know, like, uh, Dave Haywood from the MAME team said that he came across five of those PCBs in his time, so that's <laughs> how common you're looking at it. Yeah. Alrighty, so now, Gradius 3, the big mower. This is This is the one, one of the only games in the series I would put in the D tier, which is the lowest oh, where tier did you I'd rank, go for Where did series. you rank 2? I forgot. I put 2 in, in S tier, because it's my favorite. <laughs> Two, I would put that in an A. I would put that in A, just like the original, whereas Life Force gets put in the S tier. Okay, so Life Force is your fave. Yeah, so far, tier. up until Salamander 2. Okay, so here we go. Gradius 3, you're giving it a D. It's getting a, getting a smack. So what's yes. going on with Gradius 3? Give us the rundown. Gradius 3 was meant to be the biggest and the longest of the Gradius series by mm -hmm. far, and by this point... Konami, you know, saw people too looping Gradius 2 and discovering very huge scoring exploits in the first week of release, for instance. Son they of a bitch. How to get, <laughs> yeah, they got infinite lives in the first in the first week of Gradius 2. Thus, they had to put out an update patch for it. So by this point, they're designing the game for experts only. Gradius yeah. 3, you know is a game where you die once anywhere in the game and you are utterly screwed. It is <laughs> one of the best games ever designed as far as Epic Blank goes. This is the one of the only games in the series that's an hour long, but what good is that if the slowdown you generate from all the power-ups oh, can cause shit. the game to become unwinnable? Oh, shit. Yes, I'm serious on that one, and that's why it gets a D. I yeah, forgot about serious. this. I forgot about this. Yeah, talk about yeah, the if slowdown. You cause, if you cause too much slowdown on the last stage, uh, the moving laser beams of death stay at full speed. They <laughs> desync, and you, thus you're going to game over there no matter what if you fire too much in that level. <laughs> oh, my God. You know, basically, Gradius 3 is a game that was only half finished at release, and it shows everywhere including the atrocious hitboxes on some of the attacks. Did they ever patch it? No, th yes, they actually did do a balancing patch on it, but they did not fix the hitboxes, Mark. Oh, boy. So what hitboxes are do people need to keep an eye out for? As early as stage three, for instance, the rocks that fall down in the volcano stage when you go underground jut out far beyond what their sprite would suggest. You get killed by nothing repeatedly in this game. Oh, shit. And that's a result of the game uh, being rushed out in order to meet the demand for more Gradius. It is the most ambitious title in the series by far, including having a 3D stage using fancy hardware tricks. Oh, which yeah. Which always impressed the crap out of everyone. Yes, I it's, remember. It's a, that's a good metaphor for what Gradius 3 is. It's a beautiful looking vehicle that's really crap to drive. I I was thinking about Gradius 3, and it's funny because it almost, in my mind, lines up a bit with Metal Slug 3 in many similar ways. Metal Slug 3 is hella long. It's so long. It's like a huge, a huge jump in uh, length and scope. It's like their war and peace of, sh of uh, running guns. You know, it's just this massive epic. But at the same time, uh, Metal Slug 3, compared to 1 and 2 and X, has some insanely, like, jank level design here and there. It has, like, moments of brilliance where you're like, this is so good. And then it has <laughs> moments of just pure hell where you're ripping your hair. Like, why? 
Why? Stage one, yeah, stage one in Metal Slug 3 is the best opening to any Metal Slug ever, where you're storming the beach full oh, of yeah, uh, yeah. monster Epic. crabs. And then Epic. at the very end of the game, then you have identical copy-pasted hallway 20 times in the alien mothership. Oh my god. Not to mention the... Um, I'm not a big fan of the zombie stage. That one... I think is pretty jank as hell. And then the biggest one, though, is the, the stupid sun boss in that game is absurd. You have to be yeah, we basically... Can agree to, we we oh, can agree ahead. to disagree on the zombie level, but the patterns on the sun boss can be quite stupid if RNG's not in your favor. Well, you basically... I've been watching a thousand super plays of it to try and get, like, really good strats. And the best strat I've seen is that you know the sun boss is there and you preload like all these shotgun power-ups so that when you go into it, you have all these shotgun power-ups to help you get through it. But if you're just playing the game through without realization of where those power-ups are and how important they are, that boss is insane. So, and they don't give you any extends even though the game is forever long. I, yeah, I think Gradius 3 is kind of like that. It's, it's, it's epic in many places, but uh, also, unbalanced as hell <laughs> yeah and i'm also going to mention the ice cube stage which is quite possibly one of the most unfair stages on unfun levels ever designed in a shoot 'em up period and it's like a meme like ice cubes are so it's so infamous that it's like a meme you'll see people posting ice cubes and discord servers and seeing it like homage to all these different places yeah you know what there's no possible way anyone can react to that the first time around. So it is insanely lopsided. The, the ice cube will just randomly change direction and go flying <laughs> off at a million miles per hour without any warning that it would do that at all. Or any contrary to common sense or pattern prediction skills. So And that, that sort of shit is what drags Gradius 3 down. Yeah, and then we talked about uh, the, the checkpoints being... Gradius, Gradius Syndrome to the max in many of the checkpoints. But let's talk about the strengths of Gradius 3. What do you think the biggest strength of Gradius 3 is? The edit system. That is the final form of the Gradius power up bar. Yes. And I wish that would have stuck for the entire rest of the series. Yeah, edit is really cool. I agree. I really like edit a lot. That allows you to pick any combination of power-ups you please, and that stuck around for a lot of the computer-exclusive Gradius games, like Gradius, to, Gradius F, um, Nemesis 3. I'm just going to call it that. That was the European title on the MSX. So I would say my biggest strength of Gradius 3, even though it is sort of a weakness at the same time, is the scale of this game, is the ambition of it, because... I think that is what has allowed it to have people like Refkey and G3 Fleco playing it all the time. It's like, it's like and an I accomplishment also to here. get through it because it's so massive and insane. And like, it's not get just that. It. The quality of most of the levels themselves have not declined at all. And this is still when Konami were coming up with fresh ideas for new planets to visit. Like That's true. The giant, man, the giant ship eating ant lion at the end of stage one with the spiders spinning webs to try and blockade you. That sort of stuff. You'd st you were still seeing new sights and being bewildered by these desert, these ferocious desert lions. The enemies and everything that it throws at you, it throws something new at you every single turn and the excitement is still there. Thus, for those players that really want to see it through to the end, they realize the game's full potential and they push through with it despite yes. its problems. <laughs> yes. I would say uh, its biggest weakness is, well, there's a lot. Like, there's a lot of clear ones, but I would still go with the slowdown issues because that those sound absolutely insane. I, it's, it, the, the game's basically uh, tied together with a string of spaghetti where <laughs> things are moving at different speeds despite the slowdown. Like, the animation's playing correctly, but nothing else is. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and that, that part you're talking about where it like, basically soft locks you or hard locks you or something at the end there, that sounds brutal. Yeah, like I said, you cause too much slowdown, but the obstacles still move at full speed even if everything else is slowing down. <laughs> it's a very jankily programmed game. <laughs> yeah, I'm just imagining like a cave game doing that or something. The entire game slows down, but then they program in a bullet that goes like five, you know, 500 that doesn't speed. slow down at all. Yeah, that just goes full speed at you. 
that'd be crazy. And that brings us to so either I would rate, you gave it a D. Oh. I would give it a B for for pure ambition, even though it has all these mm. issues. I would go with the B for a Gradius. That game. would be a great segue into the next immediate game that was la labeled Gradius, Parodius Da. You're gonna have to guide me through this one because I haven't played the first Parodius. I've only played Sexy Parodius. Okay, Parodius Da is what Konami thought of when they were out of ideas for the Gradius series. That is Konami deciding, hey, you know, we're out of ideas for our, super, uh, for our epic space opera. Why don't we just take the pisser and th throw whatever c wacky comedy routines we want in there instead? <laughs> Thus, Parodius Da was born, and it had much more time in the uh, proverbial oven compared to Gradius 3. Parodius uh, reaches that S tier for me, whereas Gradius 3 reaches a D, and it's all because of game polish and ideas. Is the level design similar to 3? Like, did they take a lot of the stuff from 3, or is it like totally new level design? Which, they took a lot of the designs and obstacles from all previous Gradius games, but they refitted them into absolutely nonsensical level themes that poke fun of everything. Every cult single culture in the entire world is not spared from Parodius. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I do like, and it, that's one of the early cute em ups, right? Parodius is in that sort of early well, cute em up. It is. Crew. It actually defined the genre. It was one of the very first ever made in that subgenre. Yeah, because. The ones that come to my mind are the Parodia series, and then would you count Fantasy Zone as a cute em up? I always kind of think it's in there, right? It's a cute em up, right? Sure, why not? I never really thought about it, but I can <laughs> count it as one. Because Opa Opa is so cute, especially when he gets on the ground and his little legs come out and he runs on the ground on his leg. And then, of course, I'm missing, I'm forgetting the other one, the one where you, it's vertical and you throw bombs on the ground. Which one is that? That's Quimby. Yes. Quimby, who's yes. actually a playable character in the series. Yes. So you're going so, S tier on the OG Parodius. Yes. Basically, that's what happens if they actually took the time and attention to polish up Gradius 3 and balance it for newer players. And this is going to be a very divisive one because this is also when Konami introduced Rank to the series as well, in much mm. stronger form than previous games. So the earlier games don't have Rank. I didn't know that. I thought they did. Th they do have rank, but it's at a much lower scale oh, than Parodius okay. onwards. Okay. okay, so this is when they're deciding, all right, I know exactly what happened. They sat down and they said, we can't have these players taking an hour and a half per credit. We need to get these credits faster. I should, yeah, I should mention Parodius <laughs> is still an hour long. It has the size of Gradius 3, but without any of its design blunders. Wow, now I, now I gotta play the original Parodius. I've never even, uh, I've never even played it before. Now, here's the kicker with the original Parodius. Konami figured out how to make a game that doesn't have the checkpoint Gradius syndrome of previous games, while also making the game super difficult for expert players as well. Yeah, how, that, does, how does the power-up system work in Parodius? In Parodius, every single power-up you take increases the rank value by one, unless it's your first speed up or if it's missile, and thus, the more power-ups you take, the more difficult the game will become until you die and the rank goes down. Hmm, okay. And that actually makes it a rank control game. You want to take uh, everything except for speed-ups. Speed-ups actually punish you the most since that's a plus two instead of a plus one. Oh, damn. So you're like fully powered up, but you still got the movement speed of a turtle. <laughs> As you're going no, you through. can take one speed up without consequence, but the second speed up is oh, when okay. they start penalizing you. Oh, okay. All right, that make, that sounds better. <laughs> yeah, and likewise, taking a force field also gives you a very high rank penalty. Well, I have to say, I'm glad to have you here because the next one I also have a little bit of familiarity with. I played it a bit, but not a whole lot, which is Gradius 4. And I don't hear a lot about Gradius 4, I and always, there's a reason for that. Yes, I always feel like it's a, a it's a bit of a sleeper of the series. So why is that? Why is Greatest Four under the radar compared to three, which is everywhere, two, which is super popular, 
One, which is, you know, the classic. And Greatest. people talk about Gaiden. So what's going on with 4? Why is 4 getting looked over? Gradius 4 is basically the textbook definition of more of the same. It was a throwback game made to create a new Gradius game for the sake of pleasing the fans, and thus recycles almost every single idea from previous games. Holy Konami shit, was it's like Metal Slug 4. Yeah, Konami <laughs> like was the same legitimately... Thing. It, they were legitimately out of ideas at that point. So all the levels are recycled from previous games in the series. In a good way or are they poorly done? You know what I mean? Like In a good way. Yeah, yes, because that. they are not poorly designed at all. And they copied all the good aspects of these levels. And did they uh, did they update the power-up system? Like with edit and everything? or? Nope. They went back to the classic power-up meter system from Gradius 2. Again, for nostalgia's sake. And to oh. make it simpler. It really is meant to be a throwback game in every sense of the word, so it doesn't really innovate unlike every other Gradius game. That sounds and a lot that, like 4. Because... It makes it insanely solid, but also incredibly unremarkable, especially compared with its big weak point, which is the graphical style. Okay, what's going on with the graphics in 4? Basically, you just take one look at the weapon select screen, they use 3D images converted to sprites, and thus it looks like a GeoCities webpage. <laughs> it has not aged very elegantly. <laughs> How about the in-game graphics? How do they look? Yeah, that's what I mean, because it was from that early 3D era of games. It does not look as pristine as any of the pixel art games, and compared to Parodius and its sequels, like it's especially gaulish compared to those, <laughs> which were beautiful and as over the top as animation could possibly be. Yeah, so I'm going to let you, what, where would you rank 4? Because like I said, I'm a little bit uh, less familiar with 4, so it's hard for me to rank it. 4 is what I'd put in the C to B tier. I would all, I'm leaning closer towards C because it is still a darn good game, mind you. It's nowhere near as bad as Gradius 3 is, but... It doesn't get any awards or any notoriety because of its lack of ambition. That's, That's why they leaned more towards Parodius at that point in time. By being by not being restrained to a serious theme, they were far less restrained in what kind of levels they designed. Alrighty. There's all the good stuff, like Gokujo Parodius. Gokujo Parodius is a B for me, for instance. So what is what would you say is the strongest point of four? The strongest point of 4 is that it is the most fair game up until this point since it kept the rank system of Parodius. So the game will become significantly easier if you die enough times. <laughs> nice. And continue. Thus, it's much less of a problem for accessibility and newcomers. Oh, okay. You're not getting locked into death, death checkpoints as much as... Three. Yeah, the enemies will become less aggressive if you die more frequently and have to continue, for instance. Alrighty. So, is there anything between 4 and Gaiden? Or are we going right to Gaiden next? I would mention Zezex, but we, we can jump right to Gaiden and Salamander 2 since they came out at the same time. Alright, let's do Salamander 2 first. Now, now that is what I consider to be the best Gradius game ever made. Because... Rather than going the 3D graphics route, they stuck with what they perfected. They decided to go full pixel art for Salamander 2, and they had state-of-the-art PlayStation hardware to toy around with at this point in time. They made full use of it to create the most visually stunning stages the series has seen by far. It's a perfection of the series' art style. Yeah, I remember really liking Salamander 2's graphics. That's one reason why I ranked it so high as well. That and the stages are expertly designed as they could be. It goes back to the automatic power-up system of Salamander, true to its name. Mm. But you are able to sacrifice options strategically in order to get a huge burst of power in order to both increase your score and to kill enemies much faster when things start getting really, cr really dangerous and chaotic. Oh, yeah. Does that kind of function like a bomb or like a hyper? How does that function exactly? It functions like a limited use weapon. It's not a bomb. It doesn't clear the screen out, but the giant laser beams you fire out targets anything that they can home in on very quickly. Thus, it can eliminate a lot of smaller enemies very quickly. Right, 
Right. Yeah, that is an interesting idea. You sacrifice an option for this sort of... I bet that plays really well into routing, where you, you can route out like, oh, okay, here's where you need to use the weapon, here's where you don't use it type of thing. The other major innovation with Salamander 2 and Gaiden is the standards of the shmup genre evolving. Because at this point, they ditched the hitbox being the entire ship, or close to the whole ship, mm -hmm. and they embraced bullet hell hitboxes, which became commonplace in 1996. Yes, the revelation of the hitbox, <laughs> where they're like, wait a minute, and don't that need to is make used the whole to, ship a hitbox here. That is used to its fullest effect in order to actually create stages where you're flat in the middle of a siege, and the cannons are firing at you from all cylinders. So I mentioned earlier that, you know, the Gradius series at times can, especially in the later loops, can start to tend towards sort of feeling bullet hell. Where would, would you say that's true for Salamander 2 as well? Yes, it starts to become a bullet hell game at this point, especially in loop 2. <laughs> Because at this point, with the revelation of the hitbox, they could do far crazier boss patterns than they were even allowed to do in Gradius 3, for instance. Yeah. And, and the Vic Viper, yeah, that's a great, yeah, that's a great innovation. So it wasn't but, Gradius 5. I always thought it was Gradius 5 that did the smaller hitbox first, but it doesn't No, it like was it. Salamander 2 and Gaiden that did them first. Okay. So what do you think is the strongest point of Salamander 2? The strongest point of Salamander 2 is both the revelation of the hitbox and the art style itself, the perfection. Salamander 2 might not have brought any more innovation to the table, but it basically perfected the formula along with Gaiden. Like, this is Pete Gradius here. It still feels like a Salamander and Gradius game, whereas it transcends the limitations of those earlier titles by giving you patterns where you're desperately squeezing in between bullet holes while dodging the tentacles of a big alien ship. Yeah, I'm gonna agree with you. A smaller hitbox is always, always welcome in my opinion. Moving from those big, chunky, old school hitboxes. Yep, and Gokujo Parodius was the last of the games that had them. So what would you say is the biggest weakness of Salamander 2? The biggest weakness? I honestly can't think of many weaknesses at all with Salamander 2, and that's what makes it so great. Konami built upon an entire decade and a year of designing these games, and thus they avoided all of the major design blunders that the previous games had. You keep all your options when you die. Oh, nice. No... Yeah, you instantly respawn, just like Salamander. Hell yeah. Uh, there's, there's the rank system in place as well that also keeps the game challenging for hardcore players and easier for newcomers and thus they really lived up to their promise after and after 10 years and that is why i really can't think of anything bad to say about it what about hardware does it run okay hardware wise any slowdown issues anything like that nope barely any slowdown at all on original pcb and is that, um, you mentioned PlayStation graphics. Is that the main port for Salamander 2? What is the Correct. Sort of it runs on PlayStation hardware, which a lot of arcade games ran on arcade, arcadized PlayStation hardware back yes. then. Yes. Yeah. Like Ridge Racer, right? Well, Ridge Racer was earlier. That okay. was a conversion to PlayStation. But Dance Dance Evolution was also one that ran on PlayStation hardware, and Capcom with their Zinc hardware. Yeah, I remember learning that not that long ago, and I was like, what? <laughs> I actually did not know that history of PlayStation. I thought it was mostly console hardware, but yeah, I was learning that uh, some arcades used PlayStation hardware. It was an excellent way to keep costs of manufacturing these games down, uh, even long before they started just flat out using PCs. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's... That's in the, I think that era... It made, things e it made things easier on the developers, too, since they already knew how to program games on the thing. Yeah, that era of arcade and home console is the most is one of the most interesting, in my opinion, because it's like, in the beginning, arcade machines totally outweighed home consoles and power, performance. You know, they're just outright better. But then you get this slow sort of arms race between the two, and then you get to the place, like, PlayStation and the Dreamcast where they start to really overlap with one another to the point where 
like the distinction is not that clear. And then of course, from there, the arcades go downhill, but yeah, that, the only that's an difference interesting between point. console and arcade Salamander 2 is just loading times and that's it. Wow. They can be compared one to one. Are the loading times an issue on PlayStation or are they not too bad? Nope, it's just 20 seconds and you're in the next stage. Ah, yeah. It's not like Neo Geo CD or anything like that where you're sitting there waiting. It, though, that technology was incredibly unoptimized at the time. Yeah. At this point, laser technology was more common. Salamander 2, that gets an S on your list. I'll give it an yep, S and First well. place on my S list. First place on it. Yes, I'll put it up there alongside Gradius 2 on my list as well. And that would be a great segue into Gaiden. Yes. Now, Gaiden is an interesting one because a lot of people I have talked to, like when I did my Gradius 5 review, Gaiden is their favorite. A lot of people really like Gaiden a lot. I remember playing it a bit and thinking it was good. So what's what's the story here? Why is Gaiden so well liked? It's basically the exact same reason as Salamander 2, but this time around, they give you four selectable ships and you can edit the orders of the power-ups on every single one. They got rid of the yes. automatic system and put the manual back in. That's right. And so what's the difference between the ships? If you can change just the different types of power-ups you can edit on the ships? And the weapons that you get on them. Okay. So like all the one weapons will are have like a ripple ships. laser and another one will have like a straight laser, stuff like that? Correct. Like Lord British has the ripple laser and the double missiles, whereas the Big Viper has the standard power-up meter from Gradius 1. Yes. <laughs> but now, like say, if you find shield e easier to work with first, or you find that easier for recovery, you can put shield first on the list and move speed up later on if you feel like it, for instance. Is there a real clear balance between the ships, or are some ships just way better than others, in your opinion? Yeah, the Jade Knight outclasses the other ships, but they're all very usable. There's some that are like, considerably easier for newcomers, but all of them are viable. In fact, the Vic Viper is the hardest one to use out of all of them. Son of a bitch. <laughs> that's what it's I was because, using. You know, yeah, that one's perfectly fine to get you through the entire game, though. It just... You know, so many other power-ups just let you hit the ceiling easier, for instance. What's interesting is whenever there are Gaiden games in the series, like Darius Gaiden and such, um, usually that that shows a real departure in design or like a real fresh take in design. So what would you say, in your opinion, is the Gaiden aspect of Gradius Gaiden? Basically... The fact that it was the first, one of the earliest Gradiuses to be specifically designed for a home console without being designed mm. for the arcade first. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's huge. It is it is an entirely new game with new stages. And then, of course, and the four ships. I, four ships is which, big. Two of the ships are brand new to the series, being the Jade Knight, for instance. So that's a PlayStation 1 game, I believe. It is. So what would you so being for a console is it a longer runtime? What what uh, runtime are we looking right. at here? I, I'm less familiar with Gaiden, so give me a quick moment to look it up. Sorry if the microphone picked it up, but we're looking at a 45 minute runtime as opposed to Salamander 2's 25. Yeah, so it's a it's a longer haul, and then the and hit, you mentioned all... the hitbox has been slimmed down as well. It's the same deal as in Salamander 2, where it's been shrunken to half the size of the ship and only in the dead center. Nice. Thus, it allows Gaiden to use insane patterns like entire sheets of ice falling down during avalanches. On stage one, with this beautiful aurora going on in the background after it happens. Yeah, you know, the PlayStation 1 has some real bangers as far as uh, old school shmups. Um, like series, like it has Delta, R-Type Delta, it's got Gradius Gaiden, it's got Salamander 2. I admit that the only reason why I rate it lower than Salamander 2 is that it is less of a challenge for me compared to Salamander 2, since Salamander 2 is balanced to be an arcade game and has the higher mm. intensity patterns. But that's only a personal thing. Does Gaiden have see some difficulty select? Yep, not? it goes all the way up to eight levels. You can make it as hard or as easy as you want. Maximum nice. difficulty pretty much starts you on loop two with the suicide bullets. Nice. It'd be interesting 
Um, does the port have like a stage select and all that sort of stuff, or is it still really bare bones? Well, I guess Which, it's not a port. It's just a. It's a brand new game, yeah, and so. it, that's is there the a only stage negative select? I'd say about it. Yeah, I'd say that about Salamander too as well. The only real negative is that there's no real uh, way to select your power ups when you do practice on it. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Which that stuck for Gradius Five as well. The fun, yeah. We'll get, and we're getting to Gradius Five. Is there anything in between Gradius Five and Gaiden, considering the massive scope of time between the two of them? Is there anything between? There, there was just the last couple of Parodius games, like Sexy Parodius. For yeah. Instance. Sexy Parodius is a fun one. Now that that's one... the only one I have not played, so I'm gonna give it all to you on this. Oh, one. Okay, so we'll we'll touch lightly on Sexy Parodius because. Sexy Parodius was one of the first shmups I played post-childhood. So childhood, I played, you know, old school shmups in the arcades and ride in and stuff like that. And then I, I you know, I never was really that big into them as a kid. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> and, and, but as I got older, um, I started playing shmups. But before I went full, you know, Dodonpachi, playing it, podcasting, doing all that sort of stuff. I dabbled in a few shmups. I dabbled in Axelay and Sexy Parodius. And I played it purely because it was called Sexy Parodius. And I thought it was hilarious. Then I thought the, <laughs> I, I thought the game's themes and the characters. I thought the game was funny as hell. So I played and practiced Sexy Parodius purely for the reason to show it off to my friends. But I had to like kind of learn the game so you can get through it and not look like an idiot. So that was Yo. one of... That was kind of an interesting shmup I played for a bit there. I never cleared it or anything. That was back when I was like, you know, getting through a stage. I was like, I thought that was impressive, but. Yo, the only thing I will chip in on here is that actual game design and being able to get good at it, as the main goes, separates it from a Mahjong game that barely takes any skill or talent to play, as far as loot games go. That's right. And you know what? It's. It's not that lewd, you know, it's really not, unfortunately. <laughs> I was hoping for a little more sexy and sexy Parodius, but it's still, it's really funny. And like, if you've never seen that sort of Japanese style, you know, funny, weird, quirky Japanese style game before, which I hadn't up to that point, it was a real talking point in conversation when people came over. I said, yo, check out this wild game. Uh, yeah, so, and of course it has my, one of my favorite names in shmup history, shmup titles. Sexy Parodius is up there. The last thing that I should mention about it is so, that S it actually <laughs> does have the length of the original Parodius, but they divided it up into different routes. So credits don't yes. take anywhere near as long. I remember the route system, yeah. So I'm yeah, going to put and, Sexy and the Parodius. Original Parodius. Yeah, in the original, you went through all 10 stages in one fell swoop, and it took an hour. But in Sexy, no, you only do half of those instead. Yeah, I like that single system. credit. I like that system. So I'm putting Sexy Parodius for pure nostalgia reasons, maybe, but I still, because I don't really remember how good the game is, I'm putting in the S tier just because I like it that much. So to recap, you know, in my S tier, I got Salamander 2, Gaiden, and, and Parodius Da. In the A tier, I've got Great, wait, wait, Life Force. Let's add that. I got four games in my S tier. In the A tier, we've got Gradius 1 and 2. Yes. Salamander is in my B tier, and then my C tier is Gradius 4. D is the only one with Gradius 3 in it. That's my tier list so far. Yes, excellent. And so, now we come to Gradius 5, the big mama. So Which, The one that was outsourced to treasure, and it's <laughs> the first time it's not an actual Konami game. Yes, I know. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that wild? It's like one of those... I talked about this in my review, but it's like one of those mythical things where when people sit around and have like fan fiction type conversations we're like oh wouldn't it be cool if uh arc system works made a shmup or wouldn't it be cool if cave made a beat em up or something and wouldn't it be cool if treasure made a gradius game well you've got it and it's gradius 5 and it's exactly what you imagine it's gradius plus treasure you smash them together you get gradius 5 and it is mostly great Yes. So I'm not going to talk too much about Gradius 5 because I have a whole video where I blab on about Gradius 5. I want to hear your thoughts. Gradius 5's... I mostly agree with your video when it comes to Gradius 5. 
the sheer the fact that it's taking advantage of being able to place your options wherever you want uh and its fantastic stage design makes it a hell of an experience and one that actually had the budget of a ps2 game it's not a throwback game anymore gradius 5's visuals aged elegantly compared yes. to gradius 4. hell yeah and that's what separates the two playstation 2 hardware is the point where all the 3d models are starting to look like real people and treasure did not neglect that in the slightest thus we have a game that actually holds up in the visuals department yeah i think it, looking back you know we always um praise treasure for their brilliant innovative game design which they deserve but i think they're a little bit underrated in terms of their graphical ability like their games are all really good looking like Radiant Silver Gun, Ikaruga, uh, the Sin and Punishment series, all of them are fantastic looking games. It's the funny thing is, I have one negative with Gradius 5, and this is going to be a point of contention between us two. Oh. I, I associate the checkpoint system with Gradius games and the rank systems with the later ones. This one, it honestly feels like the default setting should not have been checkpoints enabled. It seems like the checkpoints themselves were an afterthought with Gradius 5. And I associate these checkpoints uh, and the recoveries with the series itself. Uh, you climb back up the mountain if you tumble back on it, and thus it can make a recovery feel just as significant as an actual game clear. And so, you know, you get your options back if they're turned off, but if checkpoints are turned on, they, they put a checkpoint right in front of the stage two boss with no power-ups, so you have to go through it as slow as a turtle and with just a <laughs> pea shooter. It seems like that was half-assed, but everything else is brilliant. Yes. Uh, I agree with you in that I think they did half-ass the checkpoints. I don't really have a huge problem with that because I hate checkpoints, so the fact that they're not there... <laughs> oh, there you go. Now we get your opinion on that. Yes, get the checkpoints out of... I would say just no checkpoints. Throw them in the garbage. But um, as far yeah, as... That seems like a feature that was just thrown in to make it a Gradius game. I think it, I do agree. Yes. You know, that does make it a Gradius game, but you might as well just throw it out the window at that point, and I honestly wouldn't have minded. Yeah, my other big complaint with Gradius 5 is the they have an excellent sort of level select system, except they don't let you choose your power-up levels and le uh Which would be a consistent issue in this series, even yeah. going with the PS2 ports of Gradius 3 and 4. Yeah. Like, you can do the Konami code, which you basically have to do, but they... Come on. Come on, Treasure. Come on, Treasure. You know better than that. <laughs> the other thing I thought is, that was a I, huge oversight. I actually put Gradius 5 in the A tier and not the S tier, honestly. I'm too much of a treasure fanboy not to put it in the S tier, but I can understand why it would land in the A tier. Because it, yeah. it's not perfect. It does have some issues, even with like some of the level design, because it's an hour long. Some of those levels, you're like, come on, treasure. You know, let's let's uh, take this down a notch here. I, I think the I I really do think the idea behind how massive Gradius Five is is because they're like this is it, this is the end of the series. Just throw everything at the throw it throw it all in, throw it and all in. What I do really love about it is the PS2 presentation. They came up with an insane time traveling plot point that lets you meet yourself all the way back at the beginning of the game. So they that's what that was. To do something I was with the wondering plot. what the hell is going on. Like, why is there another Vic Viper on screen? That was basically you, but from the end of stage eight. And it's awesome all the bit of the way. In fact, if you pay attention to your bottom, I think you said it yourself, you get to help yourself if you stick your options through the wall. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's your past self down at the bottom. That's funny. That's what was going on. Nice, so I would say my biggest strong point of Greatest Five is the blending of the treasure style and the Greatest style so cleanly and of course throwing checkpoints out the window those are my strong points what are your Agreed. strong points i 100 percent agree with you no objections those are the strong points so what are what's your weak point my weak point is i think the level design's a little too bloated they could have cut some of those stages actually yeah it compare it to parodius and the bloated stages do not throw anything new at you and they use the same gray hallways a lot of the time and that is ultimately let's put it in the a tier for me instead of the s tier yeah i think that's very understandable 
You know, compare that to Parodius 1, where every single color is used super lavishly throughout the entire game. And, you know, they're still throwing new enemies at you even very late into these stages. So that brings us to a game I haven't played. I hope you've played it. Because when I did my Gradius 5 video, some people mentioned it. So I was like, oh, I better mention it here. Which is Gradius Rebirth, which I believe was made by M2. Is that right? That is correct. So have you played this? Are you familiar with Gradius Rebirth? I have played Gradius Rebirth on an emulator. Uh, my original Wii copy of it is still on there, but I can't be bothered hooking that up. <laughs> yeah, forget that shit. <laughs> Just play it on Dolphin. That's fine. So, uh, yeah, it's so how is it? interesting. That is actually des designated to be a throwback game, just like Gradius 4 was, but yeah. it doesn't fall into the same follies as Gradius 4 does. M2 brought their best, best pixel artists out in order to make a Gradius game that lives up to the classics and brings you right back to that time period of gorgeous pixel art. It's almost like a precursor to what they did with uh, GG Last Day 3 where they made a new game in this already established series, but they do it so well that, you know, it feels right up it the It feels like a game out. that actually could have came out back then. Yeah, M2 are fantastic at that. And that's the greatest strength of the game, but also the greatest weakness of it as well. Right, does it do anything new? That's the question. Basically what it does is it takes the plot far more seriously since it's based on the MSX games and not the arcade games. You actually need to loop the game three times in order to get the full story, and it's the predecessor to Gradius 2 on the MSX. The ship is not the Vic Viper in this game, it's the Metal Lion from the MSX computer games. Nice. So M MSX fans are digging it. No, they are 100% digging it because the storyline <laughs> is super Macross inspired. And oh, I love this easily Macross. could have qualified as an anime if this came out in the 1980s and 1990s. It's an epic space opera full of betrayal and salvation. You know, I really miss the days when anime was like really mecha based and all that sort of stuff. You know, like a, a good old... Is there like Ma like Macross or uh, Robotech? I watched Robotech, I'm not gonna lie. Um, yeah, that was a very good dub of Macross. All of those series, you know? Um, it's a shame we don't get more of those. That's basically what Gradius Rebirth is. But that's <laughs> also the biggest problem with it in the sense that it doesn't transcend those earlier games. It's a far more polished Gradius 2, for instance, where none of the hitbox jank is going on and it has fairer hitboxes. But... That's all it is, pretty much. That's, and, that is the only one that gets a B tier for me. And, I, yeah, I haven't played it too much, so I'm not going to rank it. But another flaw of it that's not even its own fault is the fact that it's WiiWare, and it's stuck on the Wii. And uh, the Wii online shop is dead. <laughs> so The only way to get it is to sail the high seas for it. And yes. it is well worth going out of your way to do that. Yes, yeah, so that, it, that it's like a, a tragic... Um, fate that befell poor Greatest Rebirth. And the other games, which Contra Rebirth and Castlevania Rebirth are 100% worth playing too. What the hell, Nintendo? <laughs> I don't know. You know what they should have at least done, though, if they're going to shut down the Wii shop, is they should have, like, did a physical release of them or something, just to be like, all right. So if these games are 100% worthy of it. Yeah, like, or even like a pack. Like, here, here's the Rebirth pack. Here you go something i don't know probably you know i don't know if they could really do that developer wise but and that that summarizes my thoughts on all the gradius games up until rebirth after that there would be the Otomedia series which i'm not too familiar with me neither and then i thought um yeah i mentioned i think i mentioned it earlier um some games that are like inspired by gradius that if you're a fan of the Gradius series you might want to check out one that stands out to me is super hydora and I mentioned Garudius 95, which definitely earns an S tier in my book. Any other Gradius, uh, I don't want to say clones, but Gradius inspired games that come to mind? The guys that made La Mulana also made G3, and that's a hypothetical Gradius 3 for MSX. Oh, that sounds cool. So how did these Unfortunately, games Unfortunately, that is a bitch to get running on modern Windows, but if you can virtual machine it, it oh is fantastic. <laughs> what about like an MSX emulator? Would that do it? 
Oh, it's actually a Windows XP program made oh, that, you know, okay. breaks the limitations of the MSX. It's a hypothetical Gradius 3 uh, released, you know, by the guys that made La Mulana. Those games were an ultimate tribute to those early Konami games. Oh, I see. Uh, okay, I see. So it's like homebrew on Windows XP, basically. Yep. And they had all the time in the world. They had two entire years in order to polish it up and come up with new ideas. That's way more time than Konami themselves wouldn't have had, which possibly contributed to them running out of ideas with later Gradius games. And isn't it... Let's take a moment before we end the episode to a moment of silence to our fallen Konami brother and who have gone the way of, uh, I don't know, the Antichrist or something as far as what their company has become because so many great series are under the Konami belt and one of them, of course, is the Gradius series. I will say this, Konami actually is doing excellent work with its legacy media and porting games that never got ported before, like Thunder Cross 2. And that, I will at least, you know, uh, praise them for that if they are not primarily a gaming company anymore. But yes, a moment of silence for all the awesome projects and artistic leeway and the sense of imagination that Gradius gave me and millions of other people's way back when. Yeah, and Gradius, I would say, okay, this is, this is a hot take. You prepared for a hot take. I would say, I'm always ready for one. I would say of the three old school big titans of shmups, especially horizontal shmup, I would be willing to say that I think Gradius is the most important and the most influential. I think it's better as a series than both Darius and R-Type. What are your thoughts? I don't I don't think that's such a hot take. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maybe not. The Darius fan. I know the Darius fans are very strong. So yeah, the I mean, R-Type right fans the are front very of the strong. Yeah, right in the front of the box of Gradius 1. Over 1 million sold on <laughs> reprints of the game. I, yes. I don't think that's a hot take. <laughs> so you would agree then? You'd agree of those three series, the Gradius is king? Yeah, mainly because of the strategic aspect it added to the Shabups genre as a whole. Darius just looked extremely pretty and it played as smooth as butter, but the power up bar, that's all on Gradius. That takes more thought to utilize properly than just standard whack-a-mole game design. And I felt like, okay, I'm, I'm just, I guess I'm ending the episode by pissing off Darius fans, but <laughs> I felt like Darius as a series actually got better later on. Like, I think those early Darius games aren't super great, but once you hit Darius Gaiden, then the series starts cooking and then you start getting some really cool stuff but like darius one you know i have it on the cosmic collection i never play that damn thing as hilarious as it is to be so massive i just think the level design and stuff is kind of underwhelming yeah darius extra is the better darius one but they became better as time went on darius 2 was like the first good darius game if you ask me yeah as far I agree. as replayability yeah definitely and then r type the thing about so Gradius versus R-Type. I, I just felt like as a series, Gradius is more interesting. It, it does more things. I think it's a, you know, oh, I, I actually do disagree with you there since R-Type 1 and R-Type 2, the ones that I played, have levels that are just as interesting as Gradius does. Mm, but, but, so many but you got to look at the entire there. series because then from there you get, you know, we got Gradius 1, 2, 3, 4. And then if you count the Salamanders, and then you've got Gaiden, and then you've got five, and then you can even throw Rebirth in there. I mean, that is a crazy good library. I totally say that of, um, a, a, a Salamander, series. the first Salamander game in Life Force were totally inspirations for the first R-Type. It created an incentive to compete with Konami. Yes. Yeah, so I, I would, I'd say that as a whole, I think the Gradius series is better, but I do like R-Type, so don't get mad R-Type fans. <laughs> Hey, you know what? Gradius typically doesn't have impossible checkpoints uh, on the second loops of these games. Yeah, I'm looking at you, R-Type 2. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. Uh, definitely, everyone, check out uh, Kyo's channel, Kyo's channel. I can't ever pronounce it correctly. Um, uh, uh, got... Kyo is correct. Kyo is right. Yeah, it's the guy from um, King of Fighters, Kyo Kusuga. See, I just can't say Japanese names is the issue. <laughs> oh, see, that's actually a blundered Japanese name. That's not a real Japanese name. <gasps> I swapped the N and the J. I knew it. Okay, so um, yeah, definitely check out Kyo's channel. 
He's got excellent reviews of not only shmups, but also beat em ups, which I deeply appreciate. And a lot of arcade content in general. My latest one being another Konami game, since they were the masters of cool back then, Absolutely. Dark Adventure. Yeah, that was looking really cool, and you described it as sort of like an arcade-style Legend of Zelda, which would definitely interest me. Yeah, you actually have to draw a map to succeed, and it was made in a time where, if they were two years later, we would have had Zelda-quality RPGs on Mega Drive. It would have been too late two years later. And is the combat in that game good, or is it, like, really perfect? Yeah! It's actually good! The hit detection and the level design are actually super engaging with tricky platforming. It's if it weren't for the dumb degenerating health, which the revision fixed. Devil World is like the equivalent of Life Force. Right. Yeah, definitely check that video out. I, I did watch it. Now, it looked really interesting. As the fact that there's actual platforming in it also allows way more versatility than Gauntlet did. Oh, yeah. I remember playing Gauntlet, Gauntlet in the arcades a lot. It that sucks. There's my hot take. It sucks. Yeah, I think, like, it's one of those arcade games where you look at it fondly because you played it as a kid, but it, you know, <laughs> And then you play time. Devil World and you realize what actual level design can do for you. Not just <laughs> hallways where you're forced to take damage, which Konami avoided at all costs. They knew good level design. Yeah. Konami were just beasts back in the day. They were ab absolute beasts. All right, and any that, final thoughts before we end the episode? Thank you very much for featuring me on the Electric Underground, and long live this series that was that served as my Star Wars and Star Trek. Nice. Yeah, shout-outs to Gradius. Adios, everyone. So thank you to the $5 patrons, 100, 100, Dingo, Another Joe, Anthony A, Anthony Iodice, Aaron Solis, Asa Davis, Bo, Ben, 4D22, Brian Shiver, Chris Yusufovich, Chris Perry, Fimey Coyote, Cook Some Soup, Corey Mark, Des Ardio, Dark Wing, Darren Griffin, Delta Tango 6, Disco Stas Leia, DJ420, Praise It, Eric H, FCK Full Set, Retro Shmupper, Haosu, Kiwi, JLab, JBRPG, Jim Nockham, John Kelly, Jolts, Game Boy Guru, K, K2, Kiko Man 589, Corbin, Larage, Malaise, Mark Toms, Matteroso, Matthew Derrickies, Maz, Mega Death 859, Minung, Michaelin, Michael Stum, Mitch L Y, Queen Charlene, Nathaniel Davis, and Electron, Neon Dagger Games, Oakle Googles, Philip Mason, Rattle Cat, Raul, Rilskeen, Riff Mason, Rolf 015, Scanline City, Seven Overdose, Shmup Junkie, Silas, Space Photos, Stadium Arts, Steve Fiction, The Boot Rex, The Real Ikuzo, The Dirty Screech, The N1, The Old Bensta, TRM, Tsugumo, Twilight EX, Wabby Legs, X20 Spec, Plasmo, and Yuzakaya. Thanks for watching.